Um, and also especially thanks to my uh, co-author, David Gossett, who I think is in the room somewhere. Uh, most of the credit for this definitely goes to him. So at the end when there's questions, you can, you can bother him because he'll probably know the answer. Uh, so this talk is going to be about a compressed description of quantum states, a classical description. And in a sense, the whole talk is classical. It's going to be about how to take a quantum state that takes two to the n complex numbers to specify and compress it down to something smaller. Uh, and it's going to be a lossy compression, as indeed it, it has to be. Uh, but it's not going to be lossy in the sense of having a good fidelity or anything like this. What it's going to let you do is take expectation values of operators over the state, um, with high probability being correct. Uh, so the first thing I want to do is, is amaze you with this amazing machines. Uh, the machines are, this for a classical problem, these, these machines work classically, and it's going to be something that you actually know and aren't amazed by at all, but maybe should be. Uh, so this is a machine on the, on the upper left that takes in some big description of a classical probability distribution, and it turns away at it for a while, and eventually it spits out some, some numbers that are a smaller representation of the original probability distribution. Um, and those get fed into a second machine that maybe Bob has. Alice has the first machine, Bob has the, the second machine. And the second machine takes in the output of the first machine as well as some function. And this function can be anything you like. And, and that machine turns away on the information that it outputs the expectation value over the probability distri distribution of the function f. Uh, and the amazing thing, I'll try to just say this more formally and less with a funny picture, uh, it's a machine that takes in some probability distribution p and outputs some compressed description q. And then there's a second machine that takes in a function and a q, and then can output an expectation value over the probability distribution. And this is just something that, that you know and love called sampling, right? You take the original probability distribution, you take some samples from it, and then you can get expectation values. This is, but, but the part that you're supposed to be amazed by is that the size of Q can be entirely independent of the size of P. No matter how much information it takes to specify the probability distribution, you just can do a thousand samples and you'll have a plus or minus 3% polling error, and that never goes uh, wrong. But uh, so we would like to do the same thing in, in a quantum setting. So here's the same kind of machine in, in the quantum setting, except instead of taking a, a probability distribution, it takes psi. And what psi with air quotes means is, well, actually, they're actual quotes on the, on the paper. They're air quotes, psi, when I say it, uh, is a complete classical description of, of two to the n complex numbers specifying psi. And then it also takes an epsilon, which is going to be an error probability, or an, an, error, an error size, and a, a p, which is going to be an error probability. And what it's supposed to do is output some compressed description, which we call d for some reason, I guess for description. Um, and so it's a, it's a function of psi and epsilon and p. And what we'd like to do is, is make the size of d much smaller than the size of, of psi. And then we'll have a, a parallel machine that is able to go the other direction, and it takes this description, d of psi, epsilon, and p. Um, and it also takes some operator, m, whose norm is, is bounded in some way. It doesn't really matter. It just can't be arbitrarily large, because things blow up. Um, it puts those together. It churns for a while and outputs an estimate uh, with the property that the estimate is close to um, the expectation value of m. Um, it should be closer than epsilon, and it should work with probability better than 1 minus p. Um, and I apologize if here or in the paper, sometimes p and 1 minus p might be interchanged, because it's extremely confusing <laughs> to say the probability is 1, you know. But uh, if you spot any, don't tell me. It'll just irritate me. <laughs> so, uh, and unlike in the classical case, where we had this sort of infinite reduction from no matter how big it was down to just a thousand samples gets you an epsilon of 3%, um, we're going to have to achieve something much more modest. 
And we're going to go from 2 to the n complex numbers down to square root of that number. Uh, so the whole thing is a very modest proposal where we, we get something that was exponentially big and we leave it sort of exponentially big. Uh, and I mean, that's sort of the best you can do. We're also going to show that that's a lower bound and you can't actually achieve better. So that's why this classical effect of sampling is it works way better than it has any right to. Uh, so now I'm going to spend several minutes talking about the sort of the landscape of the other results that are in the same family and where our result kind of fits in. Um, so in 2004, Aronson, it's always Aronson, uh, showed that you can take an n qubit state psi and a set S of observables and write a compressed representation that is uh, of size order n log n log of the size of the set S. Uh, and this is a, an exponential reduction, right? It says n log n. And you should be really amazed by this, because I, I just told you that we weren't going to be able to do that well. Uh, but here, the, the difference from the problem, as I stated on the previous slide, was here the first machine gets the set of observables rather than the, only the second machine. Uh, so the compressed, the compressed form depends on the observables that you're looking at. And in a certain sense, it's not surprising that I can get the um, order in terms of n to be very small, because if I had one observable, I could tell you its expectation value with only one number. So that's no big deal. Um, the actually interesting part of his work is that the log of the size of s, that's the exponential reduction that's actually useful in, in his uh, work. Um, so we're not going to be able to achieve an n log n. We're going to only be able to do 2 to the square, or square root of 2 to the n. Um, but we will relax the limitation that you need to specify s at compression time. Um, and an, another thing that we'll beat is that his algorithm takes uh, compression time uh, omega of c to the n times the size of s uh, for some c greater than 2. So it's not only exponential, it's exponential with something a little bit bigger than 2. And we're going to reduce that all the way down to 2. So uh, like I said, the whole thing is really rather modest because we're working in the realm of exponentials where everything is huge and unwieldy anyway. Uh, but sort of 2 is maybe the best you can hope for because just writing down the original input vector psi takes 2 to the n space and reading it takes 2 to the n time. Uh, so other work has been done on the related problem called the, uh, a very closely related problem called the vector and subspace problem. Um, and this is a problem where uh, Alice gets the state psi um, and Bob gets some projector pi. Uh, so this is very similar. The only difference is now, uh, instead of Bob getting an arbitrary measurement he's supposed to get expectation values of, he gets a particular form of measurement that's a projector, and he's just supposed to output if the inner product, or if the expectation value of psi over the projector is greater than 2 thirds or less than 2 thirds, uh, and say that he has to be correct with something, some p, and we might as well make it a, a quarter. Uh, so you can see this is a, sort of a simplified version of the problem that we specified. Uh, and uh, it was shown that you can actually achieve the square root of 2 to the n uh, compression size uh, that I mentioned by Raz uh, back in 1999. Uh, it requires shared randomness between Alice and Bob, but that's you know, not a big problem. And, and everybody is accepting of that in these sorts of problems. Um, and this algorithm is very simple. What you do is you take a set of 2 to the square root of 2 to the n har random states phi j. So you just have a whole bunch of random states, but not quite enough to span the, the whole space. And you compute all the inner products of those with psi. And then you look around and you try and find the, the, the phi j that actually maximizes, has the biggest inner product with psi. And then you just tell Bob which one that is. And that takes only log 2 to the 2 to the n over 2 bits. Uh, so that log just means I get rid of the 2 and it's, it's 2 to the n over 2 bits. Uh, so this actually for a slightly easier problem than we've suggested, achieves everything that we set out to achieve. 
Um, but it has one big downside, is that the runtime is doubly exponential. I had to make two to the two to the n over two r random states, each of which is size two to the n, and compute inner products. So it's a truly horrendous thing to have to do. Um, it's exactly the kind of proof you get in information theory all the time, and then you try to run into you know, building a practical code and things fall apart on you. Um, so essentially what our contribution is, is to uh, show how to do this in kind of a coding theory sense that can be much more practical. Uh, so the first thing I want to show you is to relate our problem uh, to the vector and subspace problem and show that one is really just a relaxation of the other. So all you have to do to solve the vector and subspace problem, if you can solve our problem of getting a compressed D uh, that allows you to get estimation, uh, estimates of expectations of any operator, is just use our, our method to make a D uh, of psi and some epsilon that's you know, small, but not, not anything special, and p equals a quarter, which was the probability of failure we were willing to tolerate in the vector and subspace problem, um, and send that thing to Bob. And then Bob just computes the expectation value of this operator, um, and it will be within one one hundredth of the correct answer with probability of failure less than a quarter. Uh, and then he just outputs one if E is bigger than a half or zero otherwise. Uh, so that reduces the vector and subspace problem to, to our problem. And uh, so if we can achieve compression down to only square root of two to the n, we have a better solution than, than uh, Raz's original achievable rate. Now another related result comes from Ashley Montanaro. Um, he ruled out a stronger kind of compression where instead of getting expectation values, you get samples from the probability distribution of measuring any observable. Uh, and he showed that this cannot be done with less than omega of two to the n bits of communication. So you basically have to send the whole thing. And I mean, you're asking for a harder you're asking for more information in your compressed thing, so it's not surprising that it's harder, but it's, it's disappointing that you can't do any better than all of the information. Uh, now, I told you also that we can't do better than two to the square root of n. Uh, and we got this lower bound. It was suggested after we originally put our paper on the archive by Robin Kathari, and he related it to another problem with a known solution known as the one quarter matching problem, partial matching problem. And in this problem, Alice gets a string of n bits called x, and Bob gets some other string of n over four bits, and a thing called a partial matching, which is just a set of pairs, i1, j1, up to i n over four, j n over four, uh, which are just kind of pointers into the original list x, along with the promise that WK, uh, XOR, XIK, meaning the pointer into the string X given by the ith thing from the partial matching, plus the jth K, XJK, is equal to bit B uh, for all K is less than or equal to N over four, so for the whole partial matching. And Bob's task is to find B. And it doesn't really pay to go into the details of how this works, but what was shown was that the classical communication complexity of this task is order square root of n, uh, which is the bound we're trying to get. And then what Robin showed was a reduction to the vector and subspace problem. So you let the n, which is a big n here, turn into a two to the little n, and Kathari showed, basically he just wrote down a psi and a pi that achieves the reduction. And that applies the bound of square root of two to the n communication. So the best we can ever hope to achieve is this modest goal, even though classically you could do it with something totally independent of n. Uh, so now I'm going to tell you how our method works. But first, I have to introduce the Pauli group and the Clifford group, which probably most of you are very familiar with. 
but since I'm a big fan of these groups, I'm going to inflict some information on them about them that you may have forgotten and should certainly know. Um, so the poly group is just strings of, of polys, like X, Y, Z, Z, Y, uh, plug. This is a, a colossal cave joke for anybody who's over 50. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, another kind of string of polys you can have in the poly group are things with phases, like you can have a minus I, you can have identities in there, and this phase matters sometimes. Uh, and you can take any element in the poly group and express it as just a series of bit strings, where you set i equals 0, 0, z equals 0, 1, x equals 1, 0, and y equals 1, 1. Uh, the Clifford group is just the normalizer of the poly group, which just means it maps polys to polys. And its generators, as we've seen several times already, are the Hadamard, the S gate, and the C naught. The size of the Clifford group, this is something you may not know, is this horrendous number, which grows really fast. And you can bound it by essentially 2 to the 4n squared plus 2n, uh, which you know because you can write it down in this tableau form, uh, which I'll show on the next slide. When you do this counting, you should be aware that sometimes there's an extra factor of 8, which comes from if I just generate all the things I can make with HS and C0, I pick up an extra factor of 8 due to some phases that we don't care about. Uh, and the way I knew that I could bound this horrible sum as 2 to the 4n squared plus 2n is from the aronson gossman tableau method, where you can write any Clifford group element as a 2n plus 1 times 2n matrix called a tableau. The first n rows are called the stabilizers. The next n rows are the destabilizers. Uh, the stabilizers are just a maximal commuting group. Uh, the destabilizers are another maximal commuting group that anti-commutes with everything in the first group. And then the plus one column is that the, there's a phase that you have to carry around and worry about. Uh, and we say, take an element from this group and apply it to the all zero vector, and these things are called stabilizer states. Now, the only thing that we're actually going to use in this talk from the Clifford group is that, well, maybe not the only thing, but the most important thing is that it's a two design. And that means that if I average over all elements of the group, uh, some quadratic function, P2 just means some function that, that's at most quadratic in the argument, um, it's the same as if I integrate over the Haar measure of that same function. Now, actually, the Clifford group is, is a three design, but we, we don't need that, so we'll go on. So the important piece of, of our uh, compression is it's going to be made up of things called stabilizer sketches. So what a stabilizer sketch is, is I just take a random element of the Clifford group, or any element of the Clifford group, I apply it to psi. This is a stabilizer sketch of a state psi. Um, and then I project it onto this funny state 0 to the n minus k. That just means 0 n minus k times and then z, which is a k-bit string. Uh, and I do that for all different possible strings z. So this is just 2 to the k complex amplitudes. And later, we're going to say that k might as well be n over 2. Um, and we'll show that that gets the accuracy that, that we desire. But for now, the stabilizer sketch is a totally general thing. You could have k be whatever you, you like. You could have a one-bit stabilizer sketch or an n-bit stabilizer sketch, which would be the equivalent to the whole specification of, of psi. Um, so how do you compute one of these stabilizer sketches? Well, it uses a lot of pieces of things that are already known. Um, the first thing you do is you have to choose a random, a random element of the Clifford group. And it turns out this takes order n cubed time which Robert Koenig and I showed in, in 2014. Uh, the earlier way of doing it was n to the fourth time. Uh, but since we're going to be dealing with exponentials you know, anyway that uh, nobody much cares about these things, they're gonna, we're going to, yeah. these are going to be added on to something that's exponentially big anyway, so it, it won't affect the final runtime. Uh, then the next thing you do is you take the stabilizer I mean, the, the, the Clifford element, and you express it as a circuit of the generators, H, S, and C naught. And you can do that as, a, as only n squared generators. 
Uh, and figuring that out takes order n cubed time, which comes from the Arendt and Gosman paper. Um, you can actually do a little better. You can make it length order n squared over log n, uh, but for our purposes, it doesn't really much matter. Uh, then once you have the circuit description of C, you apply it to psi. And this takes order to the n times n squared elementary operations. So our runtime is, is already huge. It's order two to the n. Uh, and then you just keep only the first two to the k amplitudes, as well as the classical description of C. And that's what the stabilizer sketch is. Uh, so it can be computed, you know, quote, efficiently. Uh, then our compressed classical description D is going to be just take some number of these sketches, order log one over p of them, um, each of size two to the k, where k is something like square root of two to the n, uh, and just take that many stabilizer sketches, and that's going to be our compressed classical description. Um, here I've used this order O tilde notation, which is going to hide factors that are polynomial in n and log one over epsilon. Uh, now, when everything's exponential anyway, you might not care about this, but uh, this is a, uh, you know, brushing, it's brushing a lot under the rug to throw away polynomial factors of n. Uh, and then the size of, the, of, of our classical description will be order square root of two to the n epsilon inverse log p inverse, uh, which matches the RAS lower bound apart from the old O tilde. And amazingly, the runtime is only order O tilde of two to the n. So we have this horrible exponential, but that's kind of the best you, you can hope for. And then given this thing, you're supposed to be able to, as I said earlier, output some estimate E for the expectation value of any operator M uh, to precision epsilon with probability greater than one minus P. And we're going to be able to do that in runtime two to the order n log p inverse. Uh, a nice feature is that you can get multiple observables simultaneously from the same compressed description. Uh, you just choose your probability to be uh, of error that you're willing to accept to go like one over the number of observables you want simultaneously and use a union bound. So it doesn't matter how many observables you want, you can, you can uh, you get them all out at the same time. So why does this give an estimate of E? What do I, what do, I do with my uh, stabilizer sketch in order to get the estimate? So we're going to start with a simplified version where we have only two sketches of size two to the K. And we're going to say that the Cliffords for those sketches, we're going to name them C and D. And consider the uh, projectors P and Q, which are well, as written, it, it's apply the Clifford to the all zero state on n minus k tensored with the identity on k other qubits, and you conjugate that by C and by D. And these are just two random stabilizer projectors. Uh, because they're random stabilized projectors, each with rank uh, two to the k, uh, you can say that their expectation values are simply two to the k minus n times the identity. They're just random projectors averaged over all possible random projectors from, from the group. Uh, so we're going to use that fact on the next slide. So just wrote it at the top of here. And then we're going to define our estimate. This is an estimate from just two stabilizer uh, sketches. So I'm going to call it F instead of E. E will be the final whole estimate. Um, I'm just going to define it as four to the n minus k times the real part of psi, um, one of the projectors, the measurement operator you're interested in, the other projector, and then psi. Um, then I can expand what those things mean by plugging in the definitions of P and Q, and I get the next line. And this line, if you look at it, these little pieces labeled sketches are just two of the, are, are the two stabilizer sketches by definition or maybe the dagger of them or something, but it doesn't matter. Those are computable from the stabilizer sketch, which is by definition the matrix elements of this thing. Um, 
This sum has two to the 2k terms, because there's an x and a y, and they each are strings 0, 1 to the k. Uh, and this middle piece is something I can compute in two to the order n time as well, because I know the Cliffords, I know their classical descriptions in terms of circuits of size n squared, and I know the measurement operator. So you put all this together and you get a total runtime that's two to the order n, uh, which is you know, really big because it could be two to the, you know, a million n or two to the, well, it's not an O tilde, so it can't be worse than that, but uh, it's still a very bad runtime. There are cases where you can reduce this a lot if your measurement operator has very low rank, then you can have it go like two to the rank. Um, or if the measurement operator, and this is a very useful case, is itself a Clifford. Um, this shows up in things like, well, all over the place, but in particular in like quantum chemistry experiments, you're always taking uh, expectation values over polys, which, which are in the Clifford group, and therefore you can do easily. Uh, oh, and I guess I forgot to mention that then the expectation value of F is by using the top line and the second line and just and the fact that the estimates or that, that the P and Q are independent random uh, Cliffords, then E of F is just the thing we want, the expectation value of M. So we're done, kind of. Uh, oh, and this is mentioned these special cases, uh, if M is low rank or it's a projector. So when I say we're done, I, I got the expectation value that I want, but what I've, I've cheated and haven't told you anything about the variance. So I, haven't, I have to talk about how good our estimate is. If I just get the right average, that doesn't mean much. Uh, so this is where we use the fact that variance is a quadratic function, and we can use the fact that the Clifford group is a two design. Uh, so you go through some kind of standard techniques, and you can end up showing that the variance is less than or equal to epsilon squared over four, um, which you can turn into a probability of failure of at most one quarter by applying Chebyshev's inequality. Uh, if you don't know what Chebyshev's inequality is, essentially it's a tool for turning variances into probabilities of failure. So it does exactly what you want. Uh, so at the end of all of this, what we showed is from just two sketches, we get an estimate with a right average um, and success of at least three quarters. It's an exclamation point, not a factorial. Uh, so then we want to amplify the probability of success, or de-amplify, what's the word for that? Suppress the, the probability of failure. Um, so just two sketches got us to the probability of three quarters of success. Um, so we're gonna do the simplest possible thing. We're gonna say, well, let's just make L independent estimates, F1 through FL, and take the median to be our final estimate. And then you can show that it's basically a binomial expansion, it's a standard combinatorial thing, uh, that their probability of success will be bounded by this complicated term. Uh, and then if you uh, plug in L being order log P inverse sketches, then you can apply a Chernoff bound and, you, and show that the whole thing is probability of failure is less than P, uh, which is what you wanted. So is this good for anything? Well, here's an example where you just plug in some numbers. If you had some state that you, you computed, remember everything's classical, so I'm gonna consider simulation on some supercomputer of a 50 qubit quantum state, which is big, right? It takes two to the 50th RAM to, uh, to hold. Um, and let's just estimate what happens if we use only two sketches, so we get a probability of failure of, of a quarter, and pick some value of k for where our, uh, how big the sketch is relative to the original thing, which was two to the 50, now it's two to the 35, uh, which you can plug into previous things and get that the epsilon will be something like 0.3%, percent or 0.4 percent uh, and because there's two sketches uh, it's two to the 14th savings instead of two to the 15th or 16,384 for fans of powers of two. Uh, so you could imagine in some practical circumstance where you have a supercomputer compute something for you uh, but you don't have supercomputer memory 
um, you could actually compress something and have a useful savings. Uh, finally, to show that this uh, works not just in theory, but in, in practice, we did some numerics. Uh, here, to simplify things, we chose psi uh, as a random vector in an anti-symmetric subspace. And our measurement operator I just chose as a projector onto that subspace, uh, which lets me calculate in my head that the expectation value of it should be 1. Uh, and then we computed these stabilizer sketches for k equals 7, k equals 8, and k equals 9, um, and sampled from our estimate and got these nice plots that show, indeed, the average is right at 1 where it should be, and the uh, standard deviation is kind of what you expect. So lastly, there's some open questions. The biggest one is, well, is this good for anything practical? Uh, I gave a little example, but I don't know whether that's something anybody would ever actually use. More interesting would be if you could somehow compute on the sketches. So you can press your whole simulation of a quantum computer down to square root the size that it originally was. Um, if you could compute something useful from that, that would really be interesting. Uh, there's some hope of this because you can compute um, you may be able to compute a sketch from another sketch with a unitary happening in between. Um, so there's, there are some computations you can do on, on the compressed model uh, data. Um, another idea is that we'd like to explore is an adversarial model, or really just the worst case. So I said you get a probability of failure of most a quarter, or well, whatever you want it to be by using more sketches. But what happens if somebody knows the random numbers you use to pick your stabilizer sketches? Uh, then can they find a worst case that's really bad? Uh, finally, I'd like to get rid of the tilde. So it's just things are going like order square root of 2 to the n rather than having extra factors of n hanging around. Um, and the question is, can we move, improve the compression runtime to uh, oh, these two things are swapped. The equation that bottom should be the next, the bottom line should be there. We want to improve the compression runtime from two, from, from order two to the n down to order two to the n over two, which is the size of the output of the thing. So maybe you can squeeze some things out there. Um, and then improve the estimator runtime down from two to the order n on the, on the previous line. I don't know how those got swapped. Uh, but the uh, the estimated runtime is really the bottleneck in this thing, right? It's 2 to the order n, which can be way bigger than 2 to the n. Uh, unfortunately, you can't really do much unless you can put bounds on the things like the rank of the measurement operator, because just writing down the measurement operator is size 2 to the order n, and you're, you kind of have to go through the whole thing. But if you have bounds or if you have a circuit that makes your measurement operator uh, or it's a Clifford operator, then you can reduce the runtime. Uh, so that is all I have. Thank you very much. Okay, we have time for a few questions. It's okay, Dave's here. You can. Uh, in your numerical uh, simulations there, yeah. So the operator pi has maximal eigenvalue one. So what happens there that you get larger than one values here? That is an excellent question. Uh, honestly, I forget what we did when we made these graphs. Um, I can figure it out for you, but uh, it's, it's a little embarrassing that I don't have an answer for you. I'm sorry for that. <laughs> it's all right. So throughout the talk, when you mention uh, low rank operators, you mean low stabilizer rank, right? Uh, yes. Well, no, 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 just low any rank. Low what rank? Low any rank, the rank of the actual matrix M. Okay. If that's low rank, then you can do things in 
basically, you don't have to look at the whole matrix. You can look at just a sub piece of it of the right rank. Mm -hmm. And I take it back on the, on the first question. Um, these do have maximum eigenvalue. Well, I don't know. <laughs> Thanks. Sure. Um, can this representation be used for the tracing dynamics? For what? Tracing, I mean, dynamics, right? Like in applying inventory or something? Um, I don't know. Not, not, it's not obvious that you can, but that's definitely something that would be nice to know if you could do it. OK, thanks. Yeah. Other questions? OK, let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>